Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today we are learning that Tit for Tat is not actually subgame perfect. What a bummer. Last time we introduced Tit for Tat, it's a strategy in the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma that begins by cooperating, and then for all future periods it duplicates the opponent's strategy from the previous period. We have two players interacting in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma with the stage game form and payoffs that you see on your screen there, with common discounting over time. So in every future period, the players will be discounting their payoffs by a factor of delta. In the last lecture, we saw what would happen on the equilibrium path of play, supposing that playing tit-for-tat is in fact an equilibrium, and we saw that on that path, everyone would cooperate forever. And we also solved for the conditions under which no one would want to deviate from that type of outcome. Specifically, if everyone follows tit for tat, then everyone cooperates forever, and therefore you receive a payoff of three today, three tomorrow, three the next day, and so forth. On the other hand, if you were to try to deviate at any given point by defecting, you would receive a slight bump in your payoff today. You would get a payoff of four for defecting while your opponent cooperates. But then in the next period, tit for tat would issue this role reversal where you would cooperate while the opponent would defect. So you would only get a payoff of one in that stage. And then this oscillates back and forth for the rest of time. So you go from getting four to one to four to one and so forth. Given that, you would be willing to cooperate as long as the discount factor is at least one half, greater than or equal to one half. That answers what happens on the equilibrium path of play, once again assuming that this is an equilibrium. That doesn't address what happens off the equilibrium path of play, and that's really important for these extensive form games. If I'm going to try to convince you to do something nice to me today by threatening to do something nasty to you tomorrow, you need to actually believe I'm going to follow through on that threat. Otherwise, that threat has no bite. And that's the entire point of looking for subgame perfect equilibrium. It's to ensure that the threats made are actually threats that individuals would follow through on when push comes to shove. So let's think about some of those off the path threats. Imagine for the moment that your opponent defected. What's going to happen? Well, from then on, you would alternate between defecting and cooperating, and cooperating and defecting forever. So in the period following the defection, you would be cooperating in that previous period, your opponent would be defecting in that previous period, having deviated from tit for tat, which means in the period following the deviation, you're the defector, your opponent is the cooperator, and in the period after that, you're the cooperator, your opponent is the defector, and you repeat that process forever. So if you follow through on the threat that tit for tat makes, then you would receive a payoff of four in this period following the deviation, then a payoff of one, then a payoff of four, then a payoff of one, and so forth. And I've standardized the payoffs so that we're looking at payoffs that begin the discounting starting in the period following the defection. You might remember that we can do those sorts of things because of positive affine transformations. All right, so that's what you're supposed to do off the path. That's what def the tit-for-tat strategy instructs you to do when your opponent has defected at some previous point in the game. However, you could try deviating from this sort of punishment plan. Specifically, imagine what would happen if you were to deviate to cooperating after your opponent defected. So in the previous period, your opponent was the first person to defect. She chose to defect instead of cooperate, so she deviated from the equilibrium path, which means now you're supposed to defect while your opponent is supposed to cooperate. But nothing stops you from deviating here. If you're off that equilibrium path, you could deviate. And specifically, if you're supposed to be defecting, your deviation would be to cooperate instead. Think about what happens if you do that. If you cooperate instead, your opponent is going to be cooperating because she is duplicating your strategy from the previous period, which was to cooperate. So if you cooperate in this period following the deviation, both of you cooperate in that period. And so tit for tat says that you're both going to cooperate in the next period and the next period and the next period and so forth. You receive cooperation forever. 
So your payoff from deviating off the equilibrium path to play is a payoff of three now, three tomorrow, three the next day, and so forth. So you would be willing to keep playing this tit-for-tat strategy in the punishment phase after your opponent has deviated as long as that inequality holds. Now you might realize we're already in deep trouble here. Remember that you're only willing to cooperate if this inequality is true. And this inequality is the flip of this inequality. All that we've done is we've moved which way the greater than or equal to sign is pointing. Here, in order to be willing to continue that punishment strategy, it has to be the case that the alternation between 4 and 1 is better than 3 forever. But here, in order for you to be willing to cooperate forever on the equilibrium path, once again, assuming that it's an equilibrium, this straight value of 3 throughout time needs to be better than alternating between 4 and 1. And so, in fact, in order for you to be willing to keep playing this tit-for-tat strategy in the punishment phase, it needs to be the case that the discount factor is less than or equal to 1 half. And that is deeply problematic if you are following along. Because if this is going to be a subcame perfect equilibrium, it not only needs to be the case that you're willing to play that strategy on the path, but you're also willing to follow it and follow through on your punishment off the path. And what we've learned between the last lecture and this lecture is that to be willing to continue cooperation on the path, delta has to be greater than or equal to one half. But to be willing to not shift back to cooperation following an opponent's defection, delta needs, de excuse me, delta needs to be less than or equal to one half. This is a knife edge condition. In order for you to be willing to follow this strategy, and have it be a subgame perfect equilibrium, delta needs to be simultaneously above or at one half and below or at one half. So the only value that this works for is delta equal to one half. And what's going on here is that if cooperation is so attractive to make you want to do it on the path of play, then it's also going to be really, really attractive to you to get back to once you've achieved a punishment phase, once you've moved into a punishment phase. And so as a result, you can't really very easily get both of these conditions to hold simultaneously. And in fact, it only works for a single value, which as you might remember, is what a knife edge condition is. So tit for tat only works in a subgame perfect equilibrium as long as that knife edge condition is met, which means it's really unrealistic to believe that you can actually get to that. Because if you're just slightly above delta equal to one half or slightly below one half, you're not actually having the equilibrium conditions be met. As full disclosure, I didn't go through all of the different punishments and off the path procedures that you would actually need to check to verify that this is an equilibrium even at delta equal to one half. You would also need to show what happens after we have a situation where both parties defect and also what happens when you're the first person to defect and your opponent is going to be cooperating during that time. If you were to go through that, you would see that it still needs to be exactly equal to delta one half. And that's the only way that this is going to work. So unfortunately, despite the fact that tit for tat does have these nice performances in the Prisoner's Dilemma tournaments, it's also not true that it actually is something that you can follow through on if you were to be playing this in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So as a result, tit for tat is fundamentally unfulfilling if you believe that threats actually need to be followed through on and players need to be willing to follow through when push comes to shove. That wraps up this lecture and it also opens up a new question which is something that we're going to be addressing in the next lecture. We have seen here that tit for tat does not work in the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. That means that the only equilibrium strategy that we know of, at least in subgame perfect equilibrium terms, is grim trigger. Are there any more equilibria out there? Well, that's what we're going to find out in the next lecture when we talk about Folk Theorem. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.